Um, uh, Geneva Call uh, really tries to promote uh, <coughs> armed non-state actors, their compliance with international law. But usually when we talk about international humanitarian law, whether it's deliberate attacks, hostages, torture, forced displacements, forced displacement, that's focused on states. So how do you deal with that? How do those laws apply to non-state actors? And can they be promoted among armed non-state actors? I think as belligerent parties to armed conflict, armed non-state actors or non-state armed groups are indeed bound by IHL, in particular uh, customary IHL and Article 3 common to the Geneva Conventions. But as you said, um, they are not, um, they cannot become parties to international treaties. This is something that is subject or reserved to states, uh, subject of international law. And they are often preclude from participating in uh, norm uh, making processes. So often they don't feel bound by uh, existing rules, by IHL rules. And this is where I think there is this ownership problem. Uh, simply, sometimes they are not aware about these rules. They are not uh, engaged in uh, diplomatic conferences. Uh, nobody asks them to sign international treaties. So there is really a, a, a gap that we try to promote, to fill. Uh, through deed of commitment. And I think that different human organizations have tried to promote IHL uh, with armed groups through a variety of approaches. Uh, Gerhard was speaking about negotiation. There are also advocacy, training, capacity building, advocacy, um, confessional dialogue, especially this is the case of RCRC. Uh, others do more reporting, naming, and shaming. But I think the goal is really to make them own international treaties and give a chance to uh, promote their adherence. Uh, and there are different instruments. So with Geneva Call, we have developed a special instrument called a deed of commitment. But there are also code of conduct. Many of these armed non-state actors have their own internal regulation, code of conduct, uh, where you can promote um, inclusion of IHL rules. Uh, others have made special arguments with their concern or opposing states. Others have um, s made special um, agreements with human actors. Uh, this is the example, for example, uh, example of ALS, which is quite famous late um, 90s in, in Sudan. It was an agreement signed between different UN agencies, NGOs, and the SPLA from John Garang. So there are different types of instruments or policy measures that Newton actors can promote to try to elicit or uh, obtain great, greater <coughs> adherence and compliance with uh, international rules. So, so take us through the deeds of commitment. I mean, how do you how do you make them successful? What what motivation does some militia commander somewhere have when you and your people say, "Look, this is international humanitarian law. You're not supposed to be doing this." Why does he listen to you? And, and how do you get those deeds of commitment through into the group? Just perhaps uh, as a background, we have developed this special uh, mechanism called deed of commitment um, as a way to give a chance for armed non-state actors to express their compliance or agreement uh, to comply with international rules um, and to be held accountable. Uh, so it's a basis for us to hold them accountable to something they have agreed voluntarily. It's not norms uh, or treaties that have been imposed to them by states but they have agreed to basically subscribe to the same norms that treaties do. This deed of commitments, we have developed three of them so far. Uh, the first one in 2000 was on the, on the ban on anti-personal mines. Uh, another one is on the protection of children from the effects of armed conflict. The third one is on the prohibition of sexual violence and uh, gender discrimination. And all these deed of commitments reflect international standards. They reflect states' uh, standards. And they are signed by the non-state actors' leadership, countersigned by Geneva Call as a witness, but also countersigned by the canton of Geneva, uh, which serve as custodian or depository of these commitments. Um, so to respond to, to your next question is how effective has these commitments been? I think um, so far there have been uh, about 50 um, non-state actors that have signed the first deed of commitment banning the use of anti personal mines, to take this example. Um, I think, uh, as we state, there are a number of armed um, non-state actors that are not willing to, to renounce these weapons. Uh, you have the United States, you have uh, China, you have Russia, but you have also the Taliban, mm. uh, the FARC, or Burmese ethnic groups who are considered as the most, uh, the main uh, mine users today, worldwide. Um, but I think there have been 
quite a significant <coughs> drop in uh, records of mine use by armed non-state actors. If you take the Landmine Monitor, which is really a reference publication in this field, um, they, in 2000, there were 18 countries where armed non-state actors <coughs> were confirmed as using untapped mines, and why today this <coughs> number has dropped to six. So there's been really a significant progress, uh, mm -hmm. both on state and armed non-state actors. I think they have different motivations. Uh, again, some are reluctant to uh, ban this weapon because they feel they are engaged in an asymmetric uh, warfare where they are um, the, the enemy of military superior power, and so they need type of weapons that are available like antipersonal mines. Uh, others, they feel that not being included in any norm treaty process, so they don't want necessarily to abide by um, rules that have been established by the opposing states. Um, and on the opposite side, you have armed groups that have recognized the importance to uh, protect their population or the population uh, on whose name they claim to fight, uh, because they know it is an indiscriminate weapon that has been more affecting actually their own population than the enemy. And just to take the example of uh, two armed groups that are really at the probably extreme opposite of the Taliban, um, because I think we, we need also to acknowledge the wide, the wide diversity of armed groups, and they are not necessarily all radical movements. If you take the example of the ANC, um, in, in the 1980s, sorry, already, they have decided to ban the use of both anti-personal mines and anti-vehicle mines, much before states agreed to only ban anti-personal mines through the Ottawa Convention. Take the, the example of the SPLM North, uh, SPLA, sorry, uh, South, John Garang movement. In um, 1996, they also declared a moratorium on this weapon because they realized it was not serving their cause and they were under pressure from their own communities uh, that were suffering from this weapon. So I think there have been a lot of um, movements that have acknowledged uh, the, the need to, to behave in accordance with certain rules. It is often reflected in their code of conduct. Of course, there is uh, often also a gap between policies and practice, but uh, I think we can surely say that it's not just black and white and amnesty actors are just violators, perpetrators, and they cannot contribute to the protection of civilians. So I think mm -hmm. there is really a lot of counterexamples that need perhaps to be more uh, studied or documented. Mm -hmm. and, and I think <coughs> one of the things beyond landmines that, that we will talk a lot about today, and Jerry brought up, is simple access to the population. And I think that's where Ashley comes in. <coughs> I